many, William's plan to conquer England must have seemed like some mad, desperate quest. He planned to invade one of the wealthiest and strongest kingdoms in Northern Europe. Some of his advisors took a realist position and urged him to abandon the project, but history is rarely decided by realists. On one side of the English Channel lay the Duchy of Normandy. Its ruler was Duke Robert I, a descendant of Vikings, known to some as Robert the Devil, and to others, Robert the Magnificent. At his court, Duke Robert fostered a young exile, Edward, son of a deposed English king. The boy Edward would himself eventually become Edward the Confessor, King of England. In 1035, Duke Robert died while returning from a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. His illegitimate son, William, took the throne. Viking blood and a turbulent youth gave William a hard, practical personality. But he was also a man of considerable vision, able to foresee opportunity where others saw only danger. William's early years were spent overcoming rebellious vassals and resisting attacks by his own overlord, the King of France. By 1060, William had secured Normandy from internal and external dangers. His thoughts increasingly turned to an invasion of England, so seductively close, just beyond the narrow English Channel. William already had some ties to England. His father's one-time ward, Edward the Confessor, had become King of England in 1042. Edward has often been described as a withdrawn and unwarlike man. The kingdom's true power lay with Edward's brother-in-law, Harold Godwinson, one of Anglo-Saxon England's leading nobles, who acted almost as a second king. When Edward the Confessor died childless on January 5th, 1066. The Anglo-Saxon nobles selected Harold to take the throne. Harold, who had been at Edward's side as he took his final breaths, insisted that the late king had said that he wished him to succeed to the throne. Harold Godwinson quickly proved to be an energetic and formidable ruler. In September of 1066, he defeated an invasion led by Harold Herdrada of Norway, a fierce adventurer king of the old Viking variety. Meanwhile, in Normandy, Duke William's own army was too small to invade England alone, and so he worked tirelessly to recruit allies. Brittany, Flanders, and even the new Norman states of southern Italy would all contribute troops to William's coalition. But William also sought spiritual legitimacy for his campaign. A Norman embassy visited Pope Alexander II in Rome, arguing that Harold Godwinson was an usurper, and that in fact, Edward the Confessor had promised the throne to William during a meeting between the two in 1051. The claim was not entirely outlandish, as Edward and William were distant cousins, and Edward had taken refuge at the court of William's father. Pope Alexander decided to endorse the invasion. William had already proved himself a reliable supporter of the papacy's reform effort, and this made him an attractive ally. The Pope sent William a papal banner to carry into battle. The Bayou Tapestry illustrates the intense preparation for William's campaign. The gathering of men and horses, the felling of trees for the building of ships, the loading of provisions. At last, on September 27, William's ships were launched across the Channel. The Norman army landed at Pevensey and soon established a base at Hastings. The Battle of Hastings was fought on October 14. Harold organized his troops in front of a forest and at the top of a steep slope. The enemy would be forced to attack uphill. The Anglo-Saxon warriors, housegarls, fought as an infantry force, standing in a tight shield wall formation, ready to smash at any attacker with their enormous axes. William hoped to overwhelm the Anglo-Saxon infantry with Norman cavalry. On their fearsome warhorses, Norman knights were formidable indeed, able to deliver a devastating charge, famous for shattering infantry formations. After his archers unleashed arrows at the sturdy housecarls, the Norman knights moved in. At first, the housecarls did indeed hold the advantage, beating back Norman charges as quickly as they were deployed. 
The fighting was fierce and bloody. Confusion began to spread through the Norman ranks, and at one point, rumors spread that Duke William himself had been slain. This caused one Norman contingent to fall back in a panic, but William himself rode out to rally them, famously lifting up his helmet to show his face, crying out, I live, I live, and God willing will conquer still. Seeing their enemies break, some of the English rushed to give pursuit. When the Normans rallied, they defeated these English divisions. Later, William organized a number of feigned retreat maneuvers, which drew more English troops into pursuit, allowing the Normans to swing around and crush their pursuers. Late in the day, King Harold himself fell in battle, traditionally from an arrow wound to the eye. This proved to be the decisive moment. Many of the English troops broke and fled, though the royal bodyguard stood firm, fighting to the death. The Norman cavalry mowed down the fleeing troops. The battle was over. The Normans were victorious. Duke William was now William the Conqueror. The field was littered with corpses, but William searched for the body of Harold, so battered and bloody as to be virtually unrecognizable. William apparently had the body of the last Anglo-Saxon king buried by the sea, since Harold had so strongly stood in defense of the coast. William's victory at Hastings was only the beginning of the Norman capture of England. Some of the Anglo-Saxon nobility tried to resist his conquest, but William harried the countryside, brutally suppressing any resistance. Ultimately, William was crowned king on Christmas at Westminster Abbey, and so began the age of Norman England. Oh,